Today we're continuing this series that we've been in since January. It's called Epic, Living the Vision. And for those of you who are brand new, uh, this is actually uh, based on a letter that was written from a man we call the Apostle Paul to uh, a group of Christ followers in the early church about 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And uh, they live in the metropolitan area of Ephesus. It's a major city in the ancient world, capital of a province, 250,000 people. Uh, And he's writing to share this vision, this epic vision that God has for all of creation. And what he says is that when a man or woman comes to Christ, that we find out that we've actually been chosen, believe it or not, before time to come to Jesus and not only to be forgiven, not only to be adopted, not only to be gifted by his spirit, but we've been called to play an important role in bringing all of creation under the leadership of its true king, healed and restored, both this life and the next, under the leadership of King Jesus. And so in the second half of the letter, though, Paul says, okay, after laying that out in the first half, he says, so what does that look like to live out a, a life that's worthy of that message, that's, that's kind of living out that epic vision in everyday life? And he starts to get really practical. And so last week, we kicked off the final section of this letter that starts at chapter 6 and verse 10, where Paul kind of pulls back the, the veil and begins to talk to us about the spiritual war that's gone on since the beginning of time, that when we come to Jesus, we kind of switch sides, and, and so that we have a new enemy. And so uh, we're going to be jumping in and continuing that today. So if you have your Bibles, you have your apps, uh, let's go to chapter 6 of Ephesians, and uh, we'll pick it up at verse 10. And there in your note sheets, a section called Epic Warfare, the Armor of God. So let's jump in. So 610, Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord. So he's wrapping up the letter. He says, be strong. In the Greek, it says, be strengthened in the Lord. Uh, it's something that he does as we draw our strength from him. It says, be strengthened in the Lord and in his mighty power. Uh, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, let's talk about this concept of armor for just a second. Throughout this series, especially the second half, Paul has used several different powerful analogies to help us look like, uh, help us understand what it looks like to follow Jesus to be transformed. Back in chapter four, he talked about entering the school of Jesus. Right, chapter five, he talked about light and darkness. Uh, later in chapter five, he talked about drinking deeply of the Spirit. So now, as he comes to the the final, the end of this whole teaching in Ephesians. He's really going to wrap up and summarize it using this metaphor of warfare and then spiritual armor. And what I want you to catch is that Paul is uh, Paul's not really creating this out of his own mind. That he's drawing on a rich tradition about spiritual warfare and armor from the Old Testament. That in the Old Testament, Yahweh, the God of Israel, Yahweh is often pictured as a warrior. Uh, the Messiah in the Old Testament, prophets about the Messiah, is often pictured as a warrior. And they are going forth to battle for what is right and true and just. And they have certain armor on. And so uh, Paul is saying, he's kind of drawing on this rich tradition, saying if we're going to follow Yahweh, if we're going to follow his Messiah, we need to put on their armor. And so to give you an example of this, a couple of examples, there in your note sheet, in Isaiah 59, this is talking about Yahweh, and Isaiah says, he put on righteousness as his what? Okay, let's say it again, that's a little weak. Uh, he put on righteousness as his breastplate. I want to remember that. Uh, and, he, and the helmet of what? Salvation. salvation on his head. So remember both those things, right? Righteousness is a breastplate, helmet of salvation on his head uh, as he goes into battle. Now the next verse comes from Isaiah 49. It's uh, the Messiah is speaking, uh, servant of the Lord. And he says, he, talking about Yahweh, Yahweh made my mouth like a sharpened what? Sword. Sword. Okay, remember that. So uh, we, we see this played out throughout the New Testament. For example, when Jesus comes back in Revelation 19, riding on a white horse, out of his mouth comes a double-edged sword that will smite the nations, right? So this concept of Messiah, uh, out of his mouth, his words are powerful. His words give life. His words bring judgment. You want to stand on the right side of the Messiah? You don't want to be on the wrong side of Messiah, he, uh, he can build up, he can tear down. His words are powerful. And so we're going to see through all three of those uh, weapons today as we go through chapter 6. So what I want you to catch is that uh, Paul is drawing on this. And basically what he says is when a man or woman comes to Jesus, you are switching sides. 
in a spiritual battle that's gone on from the beginning of time, and you're going from the darkness to light, and you are standing now with Yahweh and his Messiah, and so if you're going to win this battle, you need to put on the same armor that they wear, right? Now we'll go on. So in verse 12, he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not human beings, it's against rulers, it's against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So we saw this last week. This is Paul's language for describing this unseen realm of uh, uh, spiritual darkness and spiritual leaders. Okay? And so he says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. So when the day of evil comes, uh, you know, the day of, of strong attack comes, um, that uh, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Okay, so, so Paul's setting up this passage. Hey, when you come to Jesus, uh, you find there's a real war going on forever, real enemy. He's really smart. We'll talk about that later. He's, you got a target on your back now because you've crossed enemy lines. He's after you. And so if you're going to win, you need to put on the full armor. All right? Now, from this point on, he's going to list six pieces of armor that we need to put on. And as we go through this, I want you to catch the big picture metaphor he's using, but I don't want to get us tied up too much in the details. Like sometimes when this taught, it can be taught, well, now the breastplate, it's righteousness because righteousness over, it's guarding our chest and our chest where our heart is. I don't think he's going that detail. Uh, then we're going to see he's just using a big picture analogy saying we're in a battle. You need to be prepared for battle. And basically these pieces of armor are the exact same things he's been talking about for three chapters. There's nothing new here. He's going to tell us, if you need to, if you want to win this war, you need to be doing what I've told you through different metaphors off the last three chapters. You need to do the right thing. You know, hold the truth and so on. Uh, and you say, well, how do you know that? Well, because in 1 Thessalonians 5, the Apostle Paul also teaches about warfare. He also talks about putting on, on, uh, uh, on the armor. And look what he says. It's there in your note sheet. It says, 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a what? Wait, didn't we just see that breastplate was righteousness? You just saw that? And as we go on today in Ephesians, we'll see, put on the breastplate of righteousness. So what I'm saying is that in Thessalonians, he calls faith and love our, our, our breastplate. In Ephesians, he calls breastplate our righteousness. Let's go on in the, in the Thessalonians passage. And he says, and then... Uh, and he says, and put on the hope of salvation as a helmet. So there's the same one, right? So what we're going to see today, that in Ephesians, Paul will say faith isn't a breastplate. Faith is our shield. And in, uh, here he says, faith, uh, love is our uh, part of our breastplate, faith and love. In Ephesians, say, no, righteousness is our breastplate. So what I want you to catch is we don't want to go too detailed in this and try to strain too much out of it. He's just, he's kind of going to use it as, as, he finished, as he's wrapping up his letter. He's kind of wrapping it up and saying, hey, the things I've taught you, let's change the context. Let's reframe it. We're in an army. So let's use a different metaphor to deliver the same truth I've been telling you the last three chapters. All right. So he's, let's jump in then. Let's see what the armor is. So in verse 14, he says, so stand firm uh, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. So the first piece of armor is truth. We're going to win spiritual war. We've got to embrace the truth. Now, here's what I want you to catch. This is what Paul's been telling us for the whole letter. Right? Uh, in chapter four, you may remember this. He said that before we come to Jesus, he says that we are, he uses the term, darkened in our understanding. Number 418. And so he says, but now you've come to the Lord. He says, so now you've discovered, quote, the truth that's in Jesus. So remember, Jesus said, truth sets us free, right? So what Paul is saying is that if you're going to come, if, you, if you're going to win this war, you're going to have to embrace the truth about who God is, who you are, who the enemy is, how to follow Jesus' path to life. It's the truth that will set you free. You're not going to win this war. So if you compromise the truth, if there's certain things in the Bible, the Bible says, you go, yeah, I don't believe that. I don't buy it. I'll believe, I'll believe this, but I don't believe that. I love the thought of heaven. I don't like the thought of hell. You know, so I, 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 no, I, don't, I believe in a God of love. I don't believe in a God of judgment. Great. You've just opened yourself up for spiritual destruction, right? Why? Because you haven't embraced the truth. You've picked and choose. So later on in chapter four, 
Paul says, hey, when you, so we need to put off the old, put on the new. And his very first example, he said, so don't lie to one another. And we talked about this back in chapter four about integrity. And so Paul says, if you're gonna follow Jesus, you have to embrace the truth and you need to live a life of truth. You need to tell the truth. You need to keep your commitments. You need to live a life of not hypocrisy, right? We talked about that. So here he comes back, he says, in this warfare, and we're doing with Satan, he says, the first weapon, or the, the first arm you need to put on is the belt of truth. Because anytime you compromise the truth about what, what God has said in his word or how you live out the truth, you have now opened yourself up for a spiritual attack. Okay? Second piece of armor. Second piece is the breastplate of righteousness. So verse 14, stand firm, belt of truth buckled with the uh, breastplate of righteousness in place. So, uh, Throughout this letter, Paul's been talking to us about this. Remember, the breastplate of righteousness is what Yahweh wears. It refers to his character. He always does what's right, never does what's wrong. You can trust him. He's going to do the right thing. When he goes in about righteousness, is his breastplate. And so Paul says, as followers of Jesus now, you need to become like Messiah. You need to become like Yahweh. You need to be transformed. And all through the letter, we've talked about this. In fact, in chapter 5, Paul uh, uses the analogy of light and darkness. He said, you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. He said, so you need to pursue the light. And remember how he defined the light? Chapter five, he said, the light consists of everything that's right and good and true. So as a follower of Jesus, we're gonna put the darkness beside. We're gonna turn from what's wrong, what's evil and destructive. We're gonna pursue what's right and good and true. We become like Jesus. If we don't do that, when we make moral compromises in our life, when we don't do what's right, so I know this is right, but I'm not, I don't want to do it. Uh, when we do that, we open ourselves up for spiritual attack. It's the second, second piece of armor. The third one takes a little bit more explanation. So he says in verse 15, your feet, so we've talked about, we're, gonna, we're talking about what you put on your feet now as you go into battle. With your feet, they're fitted with the readiness or being prepared that comes from the gospel of peace. So he says you need to be prepared for battle when the evil day comes. And he says, what, what helps you is when you put the right footwear on. Uh, and, and he said, the right footwear is the gospel of peace, the message of, of peace, right? So what's he talking about? Well, in Roman warfare, uh, remember Paul's in prison. Uh, he's in chains. He's surrounded by Roman soldiers. So when Roman soldiers would go to battle, the infantrymen uh, would gear up. They had certain kind of shoes that they would wear, special shoes for battle. And they were shoes that uh, they were kind of half boot, half sandal. Um, but they had on these spikes, these metal spikes in the sole that allowed them when the enemy rushed to take their stand, not lose their footing. And so kind of picture this. The enemy's rushing. Uh, you've got the Roman troops there. They're shoulder to shoulder. They've got the shields up. They're, they're kind of back to back. They're standing together, and they have their feet firmly planted uh, with these special shoes so that when the enemy hits, they can sustain that hit, not, not be blown back, not be knocked back. They can take their stand, and now they can begin to attack and beat the enemy who's just been kind of fallen because they, they've you know, been, been blown back. Uh, it's funny, whenever I listen to or whenever I read this passage, I always think of one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, it's not a superhero like Drew. Uh, I mean, like Dre. Uh, and I can't talk about, you know, Iron Man or whatever. But um, one of my, uh, you know, Spider-Man, you know how he is. Uh, uh, Hulk. Uh, it's not my favorite movies. I don't like those movies. They bore me. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, I know they're marvel But anyway. Um, so one of my favorite movies of all time is the movie 300. Uh, okay, so, it, I mean, it's a man's movie. I'm telling you, like, we're not talking Spider-Man. We're talking real man. All right, so, um, in that movie, if you're not familiar, there's a scene. In fact, the scene is so powerful, I showed it when I was teaching here at Rocky Peak like eight years ago at the end of a message I was teaching on spiritual warfare. I showed it. And, uh, and, and so, if you don't know the story, the story is, it's a true story, the armies of Persia, there's like a million uh, uh, warriors, it's like huge, was invading uh, through, they're coming into Europe, they're going to they're attack uh, Greece, right? So uh, they, they, I thought this was their goal. And so uh, Greece is not ready. They're a bunch of city states. They're not ready for this. And so they asked the uh, city of Sparta, and their top warriors, their top 300 warriors, 
to this particular pass that the Persian army will have to go through. It's called uh, uh, the Gates of Hell, was actually what they called the Gates of Hell. And it was uh, the location was a place called Thermopylae. And they're going to have to come through. And what happens is a huge mountain comes down to a very narrow passageway. And so even though you've got a million warriors, you can only send certain through a mountain at a time. And so the strategy was the Spartans were going to go, they're the greatest warriors of Greece. They were going to go, and they were going to take their stand at the gates of hell to prevent the armies of Persia coming. Now, they knew they were going to lose eventually. Their goal was simply to slow them down to give Greece more time. And so there is this scene in the movie where everything's set, this huge, you know, Persian army is there, just as far as the eye can see, 300 Spartan warriors, and they are there, and they're ready to take their stand. And there's this beautiful scene where they're standing there, smaller shields, shoulder to shoulder, dug in, and the armies of Persia are rushing them, and there is this huge collision. But the Spartans hold their ground. And then they begin to attack back, and they wipe out those Persians who attacked it. And this happens multiple times, and there's this beautiful slow-motion scene <laughs> where, I mean, it's just slow, and you just see the muscles flexing and the sweat <laughs> flying and the weapons, and it's just awesome, right? It's, I loved it so much, I went out and bought a poster of the movie. Uh, the tag, it was going to hang in my garage. The tagline is, the 300 tagline is, prepare for glory. And I thought, I need one of those where I work out with weights. I need one of those. And so <laughs> I put it up. And my gosh, well, the funny thing about this is that we had uh, a member of our church here, a partner in our church, and uh, she's in the entertainment industry. So she was up in San Francisco after they came up, and she's watching, she sees the director uh, at this event, entertainment. She sees the director of that. And uh, so she goes up and she said, hey, you're not going to believe this, but our pastor showed your movie at church. And he's like, no way. He's like, yes. He's like, that is so awesome. And so he sends me a poster. And it says to Mike, in gold letter, big gold, beautiful letter, to Mike Yearly on it. And it says, prepare for it. And he wrote in God's glory. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. And that hangs in my garage to remind me what life is about, right? We're preparing for God's glory. So, uh, anyway, the point is, you know, what the point? We got the point. Uh, the point is, is that uh, when, the, bat, when, the, when the, the day of evil comes and the enemy is rushing, you need to be able to take your stand, right? You got to add, and he says, Paul says, what you put on your feet is the gospel of peace. Now, why the gospel of peace? Why does that prepare us for battle? Well, because uh, throughout this uh, Ephesians, this has been the message. Epic is about the message of peace, that through the death of Christ, that we are able, it doesn't matter our background, what we've done, where we've come, it doesn't matter that we can come through the death and resurrection of Christ, we can be forgiven and we have peace with God vertically. And then Paul says, and not just that, it's, there's more. Uh, he, says, he says that we have peace with one another, that God has broken down the barriers that have separated the human race over time. He said, even the biggest barrier, Jews and Gentiles, has been broken down because God's on a mission, not just to restore you individually, but to create a new community of Christ followers, Messiah followers, who are going to rule with him as the new humanity, the new race. They're going to rule with him forever when he returns. And he said, so as the followers of Jesus, we gather together. We're the people of God. We are the, the, the part of that new community. And he says, so you need to guard that unity. You need to guard the peace. Remember, the first thing he said in this series, chapter four, is protect the peace of the people of God. And so Paul says, if you want to win this war, you need to be clear on the gospel. This, your peace with God's not based on you. It's based on him. You need to understand the gospel is just not vertical. It's horizontal. It creates a new community of Jesus. You need to be fighting for the peace of God of the body. So, okay, so we got the first three pieces. Now we move on. And so we come to number four, and he says, in addition to this, verse, four, uh, verse 16, uh, take up the shield of what? I take up the shield of faith. And he says, you, the reason you need that is because, uh, he says, it, it can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So in ancient warfare, one of the most terrifying weapons were flaming arrows. The archers would take their arrows, dip them in tar, light them on fire, and they would send them so many thousands at a time into the enemy, uh, the, you know, the, the enemy uh, that was coming against them. And so imagine how terrifying that. You're, you're there, you're going to take your stand, right? You get the armies rushing, you're going to take your stand, and, but there's like thousands of flaming arrows coming at you. I mean, it's pretty terrifying. And, uh, and so what the Romans had devised, which was brilliant, 
they created these shields that were really big shields, wooden shields, covered in leather, and uh, they would sometimes dip them in water to get them wet. And so when the, the volleys would come, they would just all kneel behind their shields to cover their bodies. And so then these, these arrows would strike the shield and they'd be extinguished, right? So, that, so they win. So Paul says, hey, uh, you have to understand, we have an enemy, he's going to be shooting arrows, he's going to be flaming arrows, he's going to be terrified. He's going, to send, uh, he's going to send temptation your way. He's going to send doubt your way. He's going to send depression your way. He's going to send despair your way. He's going to send false teaching your way. He's going to try to create bitterness. He is going to uh, fire flaming arrows. And he says what defeats him uh, is the shield of faith. So this is what we've been learning, all Ephesians, right? Back in chapter 2, we're saved not by works but by faith, right? So we come into a relationship with Jesus, trusting not in ourselves, but trusting in him, what he did, and that's how we continue following Jesus. And so all along, we have to make this, are we going to trust myself? I'm going to trust Jesus. I'm going to trust what I think or trust what he said. And so this is our shield of faith, right? That we, we live by faith, not just at the start, but every day we trust God. We do what he says, not because it makes sense to us, because, because it's, it's God and we trust him. So Paul says, you're going to have to have your shield of faith. Next, in verse 17, he says, next item to put on is the helmet of salvation. Now, it's interesting because you say, well, what does, uh, what does he mean, this helmet of salvation? And uh, when Paul talks about salvation, he can sometimes talk about salvation as something present, we've been saved, something uh, past, we were saved. But he often talks about salvation in the future, salvation when, when Jesus comes back, the final salvation, all wrongs turn to right, uh, our bodies transform, new heavens, new earth, rule with him. And he's talking about the future. And uh, that seems to be what he's talking about here because I want you to look at your note sheet. Uh, back at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, we looked at it once, it's still there. Uh, it says, uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that analogy, he says, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and catch us the hope of salvation as a helmet, right? So he, he ties salvation, and in, in, in Paul's writings, Hope almost always means the next life. Uh, there's three great things, faith, hope, and love. And hope refers to this great hope we have that Jesus is coming back to restore all things. And so what Paul says is when you go to battle with the enemy, you have to be clear on the future. If you're living for the present, you will go down. When persecution comes through our lives, and it will come, it's gonna come more, we'll talk about the next series. When persecution comes, when huge temptation comes, if you're living for this life, you're going to lose this battle. That if you're going to win, you have to have a strong future focus. You have to understand that this life is not about this life, it's about the next life. And we're like high school students that are preparing for college team. And that's, so we, we, we sacrifice and we work hard and we do things that we wouldn't. We do hard, why? Because our focus is on the future. As followers of Jesus, if we don't have a strong future focus, we're going down. And so Paul says, your salvation, the hope of salvation, what's coming, you need to put that on your head. So six, he gives us six, six pieces of armor. Now, here's what I want to do. Uh, you know, as, as we talk about this, Paul says, okay, so here's a big picture. We're in a battle. You have a brilliant enemy. You have a target on your back. He's coming after. If you're going to win, you have to put on the full armor, lays out the armor. Now, in the time that we have together, what I want to do is a couple things. I, I want to kind of lay out for you, uh, number one, what I'm calling four Principle, uh, kind of four battle-tested principles. That if you want to win the this, this, this spiritual battle in your life, you want to win the spiritual war, if you want, catch this, if you want to live an epic life, you have got to understand these principles, right? And so there in your note sheet, there's a section, and it's called Epic Warfare, Prepared for Battle. Let's jump in. The first one is the most obvious one, is that the war is real. What Paul wants us to understand is that when you came to Jesus, something switched. Like you changed passports. Like you became a, a kind of a citizen of a different country. That you are no longer from this country, you're from that country. Something has switched in the unseen realm. You used to be part of the kingdom of darkness. When you came to Jesus, Colossians 1 said, we've been transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. We switched sides in this world. So before we came to Jesus, we were under, his, under the leadership of Satan. Well, now you've switched, you've come under. And so Paul has been alluding to this spiritual battle all through Ephesians. I want you to think with me. Back in chapter 1, Paul said... He said that when Jesus rose from the dead, that he not only conquered death, 
But he, he triumphed over every name, that's in, every power, every authority, spiritual forces, right? You remember that? So that when Jesus rose from the dead and he made atonement for our sins, he now had the right to rule the cosmos. And so Jesus is King Jesus. He has conquered the enemy at the cross. Right? We're still waiting for the final kind of roll out of that, but he's conquered the enemy. And so back in chapter one, he talked about there's a spiritual war going on, there's enemies going on, and Jesus conquered them, but he doesn't really go into it, just kind of alludes to it in passing. When you go to chapter two, he said uh, that when you come to Christ, he said you once were part of this world. You were once, he said, you were under Satan's leadership. You were dead, to sin. You were dead in sin. He said when you came to Christ, you were made alive. And so he says before you came to Jesus, you were under the leadership of Satan himself, whether you realize it or not. Pretty strong, right? That's chapter two. When you get to chapter three, Paul talks about this amazing plan to bring all of creation on the leadership of Jesus and to create this new humanity, this kind of third race made of Jews and Gentiles who will rule with him forever. And this new world is coming, the new humanity. And he says, this was just a brilliant plan. And he says, but the reason God has revealed it now is to show his wisdom and brilliance. Do you remember this? He said, to the principalities, to the powers, to the forces. And so all through this letter, Paul has alluded to this story behind this story, to this backdrop, that there's more than meets the eye in this story. But when we get to chapter six, he pulls back the veil, and what's been like a backdrop for the story now is brought to the foreground. And now he says, let me talk to you. So I'm talking about this epic vision for six chapters, but he said, let me just reframe it now that you're called to follow Jesus, all this new life, but the context is spiritual battle. When you came to Jesus, there's an enemy, and he's very real. He's out to destroy you. He is brilliant. I go, often we don't realize this. We don't think about it. But this enemy is not like a guy in a red suit, you know, with horns. It's not who he is. It's like lame. Like he is brilliant. His troops are brilliant, and they're experienced. Catch this. Demons don't die. So they've been around for all human history. They are students of human nature and psychology. They know our weaknesses. They know our strengths. They've been studying you your whole life. They don't only know you, they know your family. They know your family's issues generations back all the way. They know what issues that, that makes you vulnerable today. And so when they come to attack, it's not like you're just kind of making this thing up or taking a fly. They're, they're very intentional about this. We'll talk about it more in just a minute. So you have this great enemy, he's against you. You got a target on you. They're trying to take you out. And as followers of Jesus, we need to understand this. It's hard for us because often, myself included, we are physical beings and we often don't see the unseen realm clearly. But Paul says, let me tell you, let me pull back the, the, pull back the, uh, the curtains. Be, there's a story behind the story. It's been going on since the beginning of time. And Jesus took him out, but they still have limited power, and they're on the attack, and they're, and, they're, and they're coming after you, and they're brilliant, and they're powerful, and their goal is to destroy you. And let me tell you, let me, I want you to think about this. This happens all the time. I want you to think in your life. I want you to think back over the course of your life since you've known Jesus or before. And I want you to think back the critical decisions that you made, that you look back that, that you made, you gave into temptation, or you bought into false teaching. Something happened, and it ruined your life. It got you seriously off track. You see, this, this is not a game. This is serious stuff. Um, we probably all known people in our lives that once walked with Jesus and were passionate for him that today deny Jesus completely. We probably in this room, we all know people that were once passionate for God and walking with God who are now living in blatant sin. And whether they're a believer or not a believer, who knows? But they're, they're like not, they're, they are immobilized. They've been derailed. Their life has fallen apart. We've all known people that once they, they, there was a couple who loved Jesus and now their marriage is broken up or it's, it's hanging by the thread and they once loved Jesus, they love one another. But over time, maybe there was an affair. Maybe there was just uh, kind of distractions of life. Maybe they didn't deal with anger and bitterness. But now it's like uh, they're, they're, they've been immobilized. They can hardly stand one another. Uh, their family is a mess uh, he's taken them out. Are, are you with me here? This is not, uh, this is not like, this is not war games. This is not video games. This is real. There's an enemy. He's coming after you. 
And Paul says, if you are not prepared, you are going down. Okay? That's the point. Now, number two. Number two, the second principle Paul wants us to understand is that the weapons are essential. All of them. I want you to catch something Paul says. 610, 611. 611, let's do 611. He says, put on the what armor? Full armor. Let's say it again. Put on the full armor, okay? Uh, verse 13. Therefore, put on the what? Full armor of God. So you can take your stand. Catch it. Paul is telling us something very important. Then when it comes to armor, you cannot pick and choose. Which armor you put on? Remember the Greek mythology about Achilles, this amazing warrior? And uh, no one could defeat him, but someone shot a random arrow in the air and it, it struck him in the heel and killed him. Remember that? Uh, what's the moral hut story? It's your place of vulnerability that takes you out. Catch this, men and women, that Satan knows you by name. He knows your strengths. He knows your weakness. He knows your family history. He knows because of your, he knows how your mother was, how your father, he knows how that's both blessed or wounded you. He knows what your places of vulnerability are. He knows what your strengths and weaknesses are. I often use this example that Satan, as far as I know, has never tempted me in the area of gambling. Like, I've never had to be like, ah, like, oh, no, don't place another bet. You know, like, I've never, I'm not saying I couldn't fall to that, but just initially, that's not a big temptation for me. I look at all those huge palaces in Las Vegas, and you know, they, they did that on some other people's money, right? So I just look at it like, I work way too hard for my money. I don't want to do that. It just doesn't appeal to me. It doesn't appeal, right? So Satan is not going to come after me like, Mike. <laughs> Woo. Buy a lottery ticket, you never know. Yeah, it's just not going to work. I mean, it's just stupid, you idiot. You know what the odds are? Forget it. You know? Right. Now, if the Lord came and said, buy a lottery ticket, I, I, well, that'd be different. But uh, I, I want to use this for the kingdom, right? Uh, okay, so, so I have other weaknesses, right? He's, Satan is really brilliant. I want you to look at 611. 611 says, put on the full armor of God, so you can take your stand against the devil's, what's the next word? Schemes. Interesting, in the Greek, the word is methodias, which is not where the Methodists come from, but <laughs> uh, methodias, it's like method and I-A-S, methodias. Uh, what Paul's saying is that Satan is scheming. He has methods. He's not just shooting random arrows in the air. He knows your strengths. He knows your weakness. He's coming after your weakness. So Paul says, that's why we have to put on the full armor, because if we pick and choose the armor, then we are leaving ourselves open for attack. So let me give you an example. You have a Christian, right? And they, they're all into truth. They love the truth. They believe the Bible is the truth. Um, they'll stand up for that truth no matter what. They don't care what culture says or critics say. They're going, to be, they're going to study apologetics. They just love the truth. They want to defend the truth. And so they're going to put on that belt of truth. But in their own personal life, they take off the breastplate of righteousness. Um, they give in the temptation, and porn becomes a part of their life. Um, in their whole sexual life, they don't surrender that area to Jesus. They like, well, I know what the Bible says. I need to get that right. But, you know, in the area of finances or money, they haven't really surrendered their money to Jesus. I know what God says about my money and how I make it and how I spend it, how I give it. But I'm not, gonna, I'm not really ready. Someday. That they take off that breastplate of righteousness. Well, now guess where the enemy is going to attack? The belt of truth? No, we're solid there. You've just given the enemy a foothold in your life. And we saw this back in chapter 4, where Paul says that we're, uh, back in chapter 4, he says that we need to put off anger. Remember, we did this whole talk on anger? I mean, so you need to put off anger. Uh, he says, don't let the sun go down. And then remember, he says, because if you don't, you give the devil a foothold. 
Okay? So here's a person who's got the belt of truth on. They're fighting for Jesus and the gospel. They're standing up to cultural mores. Uh, they're big on truth, right? I'm all about the truth. They're a fighter for truth. They're going to stand for Jesus. But in their own personal, they take off the shield of the, the breastplate of righteousness. And so in their marriage, they have unresolved anger issues. And their relationship with their kids, they get angry with their kids all the time. They never go back and resolve those and apologize. On the job, they're known as an angry person. And so they've kind of said, well, hey, okay, God, I know this, truth is important, but ang- yeah, I am Irish. <laughs> I'm a t- this is part of my national heritage. Like, I, no, 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 no. I can't, I'm not going to do my anger, right? Maybe later. And Paul says, if you don't deal with your anger, you might as well invite Satan to come and sleep in your king-sized bed between you and your wife. And if you don't deal with anger, hey, you don't resolve that anger with your kids, you're going to lose your kids. They may not follow me either. Because why would they follow the God you follow when you're such a hypocrite? Right? You don't deal with that, that issue of anger in your life group? Hey, why don't we just get an extra seat and say, Satan, here's for you. Welcome to our life group. We're starting off the new year. <laughs> you see? Paul says, hey, when you don't deal with issues, you open a door for Satan to come and get a foothold. And from there, he will advance into your life. So, for example, uh, you think of D-Day, Normandy, right? We had to take Normandy, take the beaches of Normandy. From there, we had a foothold to take Europe. This is how the enemy works. And so, and so here's that we can't pick and choose. We can't pick and choose. I'll put on the belt of truth, but not the, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. And catch this, it's on the positive side, too. It's not just what we don't do. It's what we should do. We need to do. Remember what Paul said in 6.10, he said, be strong in the Lord, be strengthened in the Lord. And so there are certain things that strengthen us spiritually, right? Like when you come to church here, chances are you're strengthened spiritually. Your vision gets clearer, your passion grows stronger, your hunger for God increases, that strengthens you. When we spend time alone with God, it should strengthen, build in. When we read the word, when we memorize the word, when we use our spiritual gifts, we give generously, these things are God has given to us. These are methods through which we open up ourselves to God's grace in our life and his power in our life. And so we're strengthening them. We go to worship. We worship in our car. We're strengthening ourselves in the Lord. And that's so important because if you go into battle and you're not strong, you're going to lose, right? Like imagine the Spartans being there instead of those kind of hulks that were in the movie. They're always overweight, flabby guys, you know? I mean, it wouldn't make much of a movie. I mean, the Persians come, boom, you're dead. It's like it's over. Like, if you're going to war, you have to be in shape, right? So Paul says, strengthen yourself in the Lord. And so it's not just like turning away from the weapons, that are, the armor that, you know, we put on. It's, it's also, how do you strengthen yourself in the Lord, right? Are you pursuing those things that strengthen you in the Lord? And so Paul says, you can't pick and choose. Like, you need the full armor of God because Satan knows you. And if you, if you ignore an area, you don't come under the leadership of your king, and you ignore this teaching I've been giving you in Ephesians, you open yourself up for attack, and that's exactly where you'll go down. Like, it doesn't really matter what he stabs you in the back, side, foot. I mean, it's like, you know, as long as he gets you, he gets you. Okay, so number, number three. Number three is his strategy is simple. And this has always amazed me. For you longtime believers... It's always hard for us, being a long-time believer, to see things for the first time. And we miss the obvious. But I want you to think about this. This story is amazing. This passage is amazing. It's so epic. I mean, I can't even think of a passage. It's like, hardly, it's like one of the most epic passages. But Paul said, he's come to Jesus. We're in a war. It's been going on since the beginning of time. There's these huge, smart, brilliant enemies that are trying to take you out. So you need to put on the full armor. That's pretty epic, right? So he sets it up. Uh, and so if I'm there hearing it for the very first time, like some of you are brand new believers, you've never read Ephesians 6. Uh, but if I'm reading it for the first time, if I'm, here for, if I'm there in Ephesus and so I get this letter from Paul, then I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. I got my notes out, right? Okay, wait a second. We're in a war. This is a huge enemy. He's brilliant. Uh, he is powerful. Uh, he's been around forever. He's an expert in human psychology. And he's coming after me. 
Whoa, okay, I need to get ready. Tell me what the armor is. Tell me what I need to do because I don't want to fall. I don't want to be destroyed. Right, so you tell me what to do. And I think what I'd be expecting is that, okay, so tell me how to cast out demons. Hey, okay, I expect him to say, hey, let me explain territorial spirits and how they work and how to bind them. I expect him to say, let me tell you how to reverse a curse. I I expect him to say something like, okay, you need to understand you're in Jesus. You have authority, and so we're going to tell you how to have authority over demonic. That's what I expect. I want you to see is he says none of that. He says, what you need to do is you need to do what I've been teaching you the last three chapters. So think about this. You need to hold on the truth and be a person of integrity. You need to do the right thing like Yahweh. You need to be clear on the gospel and pursue peace. You need to continue to trust God, hold that shield of faith. You need to pick up the sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. Just pursue the word. And finally, you need to stay focused on the future and the next life. And you say, that's it? That's it? I mean, it's simple. That's stuff you've been telling us all along. And you say, yeah, it is. The spiritual warfare is epic, but it's not complicated. And so many times we want to make it more complicated than it is. Um, I mean, there are times, and we're, we're a fairly large church here, so we, on a regular basis, we have people that email us or write us and say, hey, could you come and help us? We're seeing beings in our house. We're seeing, uh, we're, we're seeing these colored beings in our house. A uh, parent will call and say, uh, I, I went in to, to pray over my child one night crying, and there was a being over the bed. Um, that we, we'll have people come and say, I've just, there was, there's a poltergeist I saw here. Um, we'll have people that say, I've just got... And it's incessant thoughts. I can't stop. And it just, they're not coming from me. And they're just like, it's just so oppressive. We see that. We see that. We deal with that routinely. Right? It's not an uncommon. But here's what I want you to catch. That is not the norm. That's the fringe. What the norm is, is that Satan will come after you in these ways that we've described. And Paul says the strategy is simple. This is not complicated It's not easy, but it's not complicated. You hold on to truth. You pursue truth in your life. You do the right thing. You you hang on to the gospel. You trust God no matter what. You take that sword of the spirit. You focus on the future. This life's not about this life, not next life. And when persecution comes, don't forget that. That's what protects you. You see? It's simple, but powerful. Now, number four. Number four is the time is now. I want you to look at something that Paul says in 6.13. And Paul says, therefore... Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you can take your stand. Put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes. Now, I want you to notice two things from that passage. One thing is there's such a, such a thing as a day of evil. That spiritually, all lives, uh, all days are not created equal. Just like in a real battle. If you go back to the scene of Persia, the Persian army coming against the Spartans, that if you watch that movie or you think about any battle, every, that in war is not every day is the day of big assault. There's a lot of days. There's preparation going on. There's planning going on. There's scheming going on. Strategies going on, right? But, but there are certain days when the, the enemy launches a full assault. Think D-Day. We have launched an assault, Right? And what Paul says is in the spiritual realm, don't think that just because you're not experiencing any major temptation or major struggles or major doubts or fears or depression, don't think that Satan has left you. He's not left you. He's scheming. He's planning. He's strategizing the next 
major attack. Major attacks don't happen every day. Minor attacks happen every day, not major attacks. Great example, there in your note sheet, from the life of Jesus, you know, he goes in the wilderness for the 40 days, the desert, to wrestle with Satan, to kind of be tempted for 40 days. And at the end of the 40 days, there's that big uh, finale, right? Grand, grand finale at the end. And you remember that, how did, Jesus, how did Jesus fight that? He fought it with the word of God, the sword of the spirit, remember? So remember, I don't know if you remember that scene, but Jesus in the desert, Satan's been tempting him for 40 days, according to Mark's gospel. At the end of it, one final assault. It's an evil day. And Satan comes with three major temptations that Jesus was very vulnerable to at the time. And, and so as the temptations come, Jesus has been meditating on the word of God for the last 40 days. And my hunch is he's meditating a lot in the book of Deuteronomy. His Deuteronomy is about Israel being tested in the wilderness and preparing for their new life in, in the promised land. Jesus is in the world. He's being tested to see what's in his heart as the, the representative of the new Israel going in the promised land. And, and so it's interesting because when the three temptations come, what does Jesus do? He doesn't argue. He doesn't debate. For each temptation, he quotes a passage from Deuteronomy. And he disarms the enemy. The lie comes, the truth disarms it. Right? You see the sword of the Spirit. There, the word of God disarming the enemy. That's what Paul says, sword of the Spirit. But here's what I want you to catch. After that 40 days, Jesus has won the battle. He comes back now in the power of the Spirit, Luke says, to launch his ministry. But look what Luke says. This is so fascinating to me. In Luke 4, 13, there in your note sheet, he says, when the devil had finished all this, this tempting, he left him until a what? Can we say that again? An opportune time. Yes, he's vulnerable. You see, there are times in our life that aren't opportune. Guess what? What do you think Satan does? Launch a full-off assault on you at an inopportune time? What do you think, he's an idiot? Of course not. He's smart. He's brilliant. He's been doing this for thousands of years. He waits till an opportune time, which is what Paul's calling here the day of evil. At the opportune time, he will strike. Right? That's the first thing I want you to know. Something that's a day of evil. We all face them. The second thing I want you to note from 6.13, let's look at 6.13 again, though. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take your stand. Catch this. When do you put your armor on? Now. You put your armor on. He says, put on the armor of God now so that when the day of evil comes, you can take your stand. If you wait to put on your armor until the day of evil comes, you are going down. Imagine this. The Persians are racing and like, hey, Frank, you got my helmet? No, I got your sword, but I don't have your helmet. <laughs> like, you are going down. This is the reason like, Pearl Harbor worked because we didn't know they are coming. Yeah. Right? The most powerful attacks are surprise attacks. Yeah. And when you're not ready and the enemy comes... You're going down. So Paul says, put your armor on now. The time is now. So you say, what does that look like? You do not wait until a major temptation comes into your life in terms of integrity. You do not wait till that day to say, where is that belt of truth? You put on the belt of truth now and you learn to follow Jesus and surrender to him and all the smaller compromises the enemy will bring to you. And so when the day of evil comes, you are ready. You've got the belt of truth on. You don't wait till the day of evil comes to develop a close and deep personal relationship with Jesus. It's too late. It's too late to learn how to listen to the voice of the Spirit on the day of evil. You have to listen now. You have to learn that now. It's too late to make up your decisions about sexual purity when the day of evil comes. Right? This is an area of your life you're like, yeah, I know it's not quite right. I, just, I know it's not right. I shouldn't, but whatever. And, and so you're like, but someday I'm going to get to that. Right? But in the meantime, I'm going to kind of mess around some. And I'm going to play with porn and I'm going to kind of fantasize. and I'm not, I'm just, I know I need to get that right. Guess what? 
When the day of evil comes and someone from your workplace approaches you to have a relationship, you had better be ready. Like when Joseph, when Potiphar's wife came to Joseph and grabbed him and said, have sex with me, you better be ready. It's too late to say, where's that breast of right, breastplate of righteousness? You see? See, we develop character in the quiet times. You make your choices in the quiet times. You decide today, my body belongs to Jesus. His spirit has filled me. His spirit is in my spirit. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I do not belong to myself. I belong to God to bring glory to God. And I decide that now. And when the temptation comes and the woman or the man comes and says, come with me, you say, no, it is a major collision. It is a major temptation. But you stand firm because you have prepared yourself for that day. So we don't, we can't wait. And men and women, we do this all the time. We pick and choose. Instead of coming in the leadership of our commander in chief and standing behind him, we say, okay, here's his instructions. The, the commander in chief told me to be ready for battle. Here's the six things I need to do. And I, I like one through four. Those are awesome. The last two, not so much. I think, I think four out of six is a good thing. I think I've got to do it. And when the battle comes and the Persians are, 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 are racing and the arrows, the flaming arrows are in the sky, those arrows are going to find your weakness and they're going to take you down. You cannot wait to the evil day to decide who you're going to follow to come under the leadership of your king and put on the full armor of God. And so Paul is beginning to wrap up this letter. We'll look more at this final passage next week, but he begins to wrap it up. He says, we have a very real enemy. He says, don't, he says, don't get me wrong. Uh, our commander-in-chief, our king, uh, Messiah, the one with the sword out of his mouth, he's, defend, he's already defeated this guy at the cross. And so, but he says, but the power is real. And so if you're going to win, you need to stand with your king. You need to come under his leadership. You need to follow these instructions. Stand with him and catch this. If you will come, if you'll be strengthened by the Lord and you'll pursue the Lord and you surrender your life under the leadership of your king, you will stand. You will. This enemy is not too big. He's not too powerful. He's not too bright because we stand in the power of our Messiah who has conquered him. We are in his side. We wear his righteousness. We have his wisdom. We are empowered by his spirit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Greater is he that is in us than he is in the world. But if you think you can stand out from your Messiah, you think you can stand out on your own, you think you cannot be strengthened in the Lord, you think you can pick and choose which armor, then you are an idiot. And you are going down. Yeah, was that plain enough? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, because we're not following instructions, right? There's someone out there trying to kill you, destroy you, derail you, ruin your life, ruin your marriage, ruin your walk with God, take you away from Jesus completely. You have an enemy but we stand behind our king. And as long as we're in his king, strengthened by his power, got his armor on, nothing can touch us. It will not be easy. When those Persians come on the day of evil, it will take everything you have to resist that collision. But if you're prepared, then when that time comes, you will stand and you will go on to live an epic life. Amen?